Um, so yeah, I'd like to welcome uh, Jiasi Chen to our uh, Elixir Open meetings. Thank you, Jiasi, for uh, for uh, joining us. This is going to be a, somewhat of a continuation uh, of the uh, discussion we had with Nail, and I know there were you know a lot of questions when we and a lot of pent up uh, discussion that uh, we left your talk with. Uh, so uh, Jiasi, just by way of introduction, is uh, prof associate professor at University of Michigan, uh, at, at UC Riverside right now, but moving to University of Michigan. And uh, you won career award and uh, a meta research, a meta uh, fellowship or a meta research award. So we are really excited to see what you have to say about security and privacy in AR, VR, and how Elixir can help. Yeah. Awesome, thank you for the introduction. Let me share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, yeah, as, as uh, Dr. Abby mentioned, um, this is a sort of continuation of the talk that um, Dr. Nail Abu Ghazali gave uh, about a month and a half ago at the end of October. Um, so, I'll be talking about more about some of our ongoing work on multi user platforms. Um, um, we work closely together, so actually Niall has already presented a lot of the work that we've done. So, actually, the, today's talk, the talk portion will actually be fairly short. Um, just summarizing some of our more ongoing research, and then I'm hoping to we have a lot of time for a discussion and how we can integrate with Elixir or collaborate on on different research topics. Okay, great. Um, so I'll just over, uh, review our system um, overview. So we have a bunch of um, devices, to, a de device down here, and it has various sensors for the environment, like a camera, inertial measurement unit, microphone, and eye tracker. And those sensors go to a bunch of software development platforms that process this data and provide higher level abstractions to the various applications running on the device. So uh, the first type of attacks that um, we've sort of are more mature in our research, um, which Dr. Um, Abu Ghazali talked about last time, uh, are these side channel attacks from the earlier talk. So I'll review those briefly, but I won't go into much detail, but we can hopefully we can discuss. And um, we're also thinking about when you have multiple users present. So I have one user here on the left and another user here on the right. And that user also has a device doing the same kind of processing. So um, when multiple users want to have a shared experience, they want to see the same set of virtual holograms in the same virtual or physical space, they need to communicate some information with each other. And um, that information is some kind of shared state that could be stored in the cloud or also peer to peer. And um, we envision there are a set of attacks that rely on um, altering this shared state that's uh, between the two devices, between multiple devices. Uh, and we call these uh, location teleportation attacks. And um, I'll be talking about our ongoing work on this attack type today. And uh, finally, we have some thoughts about um, different types of inputs you could provide to the AR system. So just like you had adversarial inputs in machine learning, um, what kinds of adversarial inputs could you provide to an AR device or VR device that could lead to bad effects um, to the display? So I'll also uh, talk about our ongoing work on, on adversarial inputs. And then I'll briefly summarize um, what Niall talked about last time, just so we kind of refresh our memories and then hopefully we can have some discussion. So it was, oh, sorry, why is this here again? Okay, so this is a summary of the kinds of side channel text that Niall talked about last time. So what we basically did was look at different types of side channels. So for example, performance counters, like the frame rates or the vertex count, uh, side channel like the head pose of the device of the headset or um, network bandwidth side channels, excuse me. And we were able to infer different quantities from this from another application. So things we were able to infer were quantities like hand gestures, um, which foreground app the user was using, how far bystanders were, what digits the user was typing, what voice commands the user was saying, what words the user was typing, and so on. So this just summarizes what, what Niall talked about last time. And on the right here, I'm just showing an example again, just to refresh our memory. So this is an example of the head pose side channel. So here, as the user is typing words on their display, they move their head very subtly in small ways. And what we basically showed was that a malicious background app could cap take these head pose information and use that to infer the characters that the user is typing. So on this plot here, on the x-axis I have time, 
on the y axis is the angular velocity reported by the headset. And what we see is that as the user types different words, Apple or map, we see different kinds of patterns on the uh, headset the angular velocity. And we're actually able to do like machine learning and so on to infer the words from the, from the pattern, the time series uh, patterns. Um, I did want to show some other, an example of the of third row here, the network bandwidth side channel. So these are results that we've taken from um, uh, VR apps that send data back and forth to the network. And I thought it might be relevant because I know that at Elixir, you're, you, you, you guys are working on offloading and things like that, which will involve a bunch of network traffic, right? So what we've done in this experiment is we asked the question, for traffic reveal the app usage? So we've taken four popular uh, VR applications and we've measured their bandwidth going to and from the headset. So the blue line is from the headset, the red line is to the headset. And what we can see is that each of these applications have very different sort of signatures in terms of their bandwidth usage. So probably from this, we would be able to infer what app the user is using just by um, looking at the network bandwidth traces, um, which would be easily obtainable using like common tools like Wireshark. So this might be an interesting side channel to, to explore in the, in the context of Elixir. Um, and then also, now I'll discuss last time these potential mitigations, um, for example, reducing the sampling rate of a side channel. So on the x-axis here is the side channel sampling rate. On the y-axis here is the attack accuracy. And we can see that the attack accuracy doesn't lower very much as you decrease the sampling rate. So basically, these kinds of obvious defenses are not very good, and we have to do some more work on developing other, on developing better defenses. So we had some ideas for other types of defenses, like blocking access, providing user permissions. Maybe we need other, uh, more sophisticated methods. Um, so that's just summarizing our work so far. Uh, we talked about different types of attacks. Um, the attack type one was these side channel attacks. The attack type two is adversarial inputs. Attack type three is lo the location teleportation devices. So we've kind of shown that some of these attacks could work, um, but we don't have really good mitigation strategies yet. And I think that's maybe an opportunity for further collaboration and research. So that's my very high level summary of some of our the remaining work that, uh, that we've been working on. And here I'm hoping that we can open up for discussion. Um, I put some questions here, uh, maybe that to set the, set the floor. Um, so for example, how could we build Elixir security into Elixir from the ground up? Um, attacks you mentioned are mostly on the attack side, but we haven't really thought about the defenses that much. So it might be a good platform to, to work on the defense side. Um, a lot of the work I showed you today works kind of incomplete. We haven't shown the visualization part, so that might be something nice to do in Elixir. Um, and I think an advantage of Elixir is, is also really allows you to play with the internals. So some of our attacks focus a lot on visual inertial odometry, which in off-the-shelf platforms like Oculus or HoloLens, you can't play with them. They're totally closed. So I think that could be a really nice advantage of, of working with Elixir. Um, some questions I have are like, do the, if we do develop defense in Elixir, how do we then translate that or tra ensure that they can transfer to off-the-shelf systems, right? I think that's a question any reviewer would ask. Um, maybe you guys have thoughts on that. And then I also had some thoughts about future research things, uh, topics that we could possibly collaborate on, um, like security risks from sort of this offloaded network data. And um, also we have some work on shared memory for AR. Um, I know Ave is an expert on, on, on memory uh, accesses. So we have recently done some, uh, have this like open platform that we've made for visual neural geometry with shared memory. So there might be some, some possible uh, topics to work on together there. But yeah, that, that's all I have to present. I hope that maybe we can discuss a bit more. Oh, this is fantastic. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jesse, and thanks for leaving time for uh, discussion and for the thoughtful uh, questions. Uh, so let's open this up to questions and follow on. I, get, I see Abhishek's hand up. Oh, hi, I have one question. The one you had uh, where you tried to figure out side channel attacks using the network traffic. Mm -hmm. The first question, was the network traffic encrypted? 
Um, yes, it's mostly encrypted. So it's what we have shown there is just the total byte count. So there have been other works that uh, from UC, uh, UC Irvine that basically try to decrypt the data and look at what's inside. But that involved a lot of hacking on basically the client devices to get that to work. So, um, yeah. You know, now there's like most of the, like uh, you have this HTTPS, so there's already SSL TLS, but you could also have the next level of encryption. You could have on top of that, you can have a VPN actually. So that and VPN adds really more security because uh, these things, one, you could figure it out like bitrate, how it changes. Some of the VPN solution like uh, from AppSecure, they add extra pad. So mm -hmm. it will look like the traffic is constant. You won't be able to figure out. So traffic size is pretty much the same. Everything is smooth. So what is really happening is whenever needed, the company solution is adding yeah. some extra padding. So yeah, I guess that could that could really obscure the the sort of um, packet count. Um, but I guess one worry there is if you add all this padding, then you're probably transferring a bit of extra data, right? Because you'd probably pad it up to the maximum. So then that might decrease your um, that might impact the latency of the VR experience because you might be transferring extra extra bits along. Um, so I wonder what that trade off would look like. Um, but yeah, it, it might be interesting to explore how VPN as a padding as a possible defense or any padding, I guess. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Great. Are there other questions? I have several. Or addressing the um, discussion. Can I have a couple of questions? Please. Yeah, please. So first of all, about like the side channel leakages you mentioned. Uh, as a, so what I'm thinking is, uh, shall we try to attack or try to find the side channel leakages from some commercial products instead of, you know, like we develop the hardware platform by ourselves? Because if we're developing them by ourselves, then people are gonna say, okay, this could be related to our implementation. But if we're doing something commercial, then we can say that, okay, this is related to like the industry implementation or, or whatever, you know, like the CPU, GPU systems. So I'm wondering like, what opinions do you have on that? Yeah, um, so the attacks that we showed here and like um, we had more results last time, they're actually all on commercial devices. Right. So um, if we did it, these are on Quest 2 and HoloLens 2. Um, so the attacks that we've all shown here, but I think your concern is totally valid because what I'm thinking is if we show defenses on another platform like Elixir, then how do we show that those defenses translate to, to real devices as well? Um, so actually, that's kind of more a question I had for, for you guys. How, how do you kind of, you know, if you write a paper or something on, on with Elixir, how do you then convince people that the same problem happens in on real devices or same solutions would work on real devices? So um, again, it, it depends on, you know, what kind of uh, work you're doing, right? So Elixir runs on multiple platforms and uh, we have not... Um, put this out yet, but we almost have uh, Elixir running on smartphones right now, for example. Um, and so we could, um, so, so in terms of the hardware platform, they are, uh, you know, we can run Elixir on standard hardware platforms. Um, I think the true value of Elixir is uh, one, um, uh, you know, if you want to change things in the runtime, right? So if your defenses are related to VIO algorithms, for example, or yeah. as an attack, you want to break the VIO algorithm, right? You want to, um, so so then Elixir, I think, is the only platform uh, out there that's end-to-end -end that will allow you to actually do that in a, in a reasonable way. Mm -hmm. so the second um, type of um, example is, uh, to, so you can, uh, you know, there's nothing, um, um, uh, de depending on the side channel that you're showing, right? So if it's related to uh, some cache behavior or some, or like in this case, you know, just moving off the head and so on, uh, these are things that are common, right? To to all, uh, to, or could be a, a, an issue in, in many platforms. And so in that case, you would show that, Hey, I mean, if your platform has this side channel, then that's a problem. 
In terms of defenses, it's the same thing, right? Um, architects do so much work on simulation, right? And, and they expect their work to be used in industry. Here, we actually have an end-to-end -end system and, uh, and it's showing, you know, your work would show that, hey, this defense actually works in this system. And then, uh, you know, the, the particular vendor would need to figure out how to adapt it to, to their system. And hopefully it would just follow naturally, right? So, um, mm -hmm. it, I mean, it's, it's, it's like doing any other research with, with another research test bed, right? That you, 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 you show a proof of concept and then, and then work with the vendors to see how that needs to adapt to their system. Yeah, yeah, no, I think you're right. I think some of these are general enough that they would apply to any system. And then maybe some of the more hardware oriented ones, then if we use the same hardware, they should hopefully show the same side channels. So then the attacks right. would be applicable. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. So, for example, we are now looking at, uh, you know, when we start running on Snapdragon chipset, for example, right? So that would be mm -hmm. like a bunch of accelerators that we already, we, we don't have that right now, but that's, uh, you know, an, an immediate part of our plan like next semester. Um, you know, so then you would have a test bed that actually you can see what's happening within accelerators and if that those expose certain types of side channels that people haven't looked at yet, for example. And then they may not be the exact same as in another vendor's device, but it gives, uh, you know, uh, it, it takes the research forward that, you know, the, the specific accelerators that other vendors have, um, you can try. So, uh, so, I, so we are working towards supporting, a, you know, much larger diversity of hardware than, than we have. Mm -hmm. and so yeah. That, that I also saw that, you, I mean, I read that you're also looking at um, using the Unity game engine, right? Because I was thinking for like the, a lot of the applications that we play with, these are, I mean, some of them are in, a lot of them are in Unity, I think. So, so yeah, so, at, you know, I, so Unity that. has not, sorry, sorry, go ahead, Jancy. No, I was just going to say, if, if we have the ability to have Unity applications, then we could also explore other side channels like the network bandwidth, because then we could say that these are popular applications, yeah. Yeah. But I, I don't know how the progress is there. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Unity uh, right now, so we uh, try to stick with open XR applications because that is an emerging standard. Um, Unity right now, their open XR Linux port isn't quite there yet as far as I know, but Unreal is. So we definitely have Unreal working and we will be putting out, uh, you know, the, having a release out that will help with that very soon. It's almost there. Um, but once we have the Android port set up, then I think we can start with Unity as well for OpenXR. We, we Very cool. That, yeah, but definitely for Unreal. Okay, yeah, that sounds cool. Sorry, I feel like I'm just like, requesting all these features from you. But... <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, the hope is that, uh, uh, so so we have various people, not just, so Elixir is no longer, you know, just my group, right? So there's others contributing now, and the mm -hmm. hope is that uh, folks like you will start contributing as well, and you're not just asking for features, but actually contributing features. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um... So uh, I'm sorry to to jump in. Uh, so I wonder whether there is value in uh, demonstrating that some of the attacks that we've shown on Unreal, for example, also apply here, uh, and and start thinking of uh, maybe a security benchmark where we have a number of attacks that ah. to, um, that will yeah. be fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, uh, you know, in terms of all of the, the work that you had with all the performance counters and so on, right? So we already have several counters within Elixir, you know, again, depending on the platform, but also from software point of view, you know, you had a lot of frame drops and so on and so forth. So all of that we already report. And uh, it would be interesting to see what other signatures, you know, carry information and uh, uh, use this as a testbed platform to show that off. Yeah, and then people can use it to, to come up with defenses. Great. Yeah, no, that would be fantastic. And then, um, so let's see. Uh, uh, so, uh, so does do um, uh, you know? You talked about poisoning the IMU, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Do yeah. the, uh, so are you able to do that with the commercial headsets or? No, that's all simulation so far. So yeah. we just play a visual inertial the VIO unit. And yeah, yeah. So 
Right, right. So you would be able to do that with Elixir, for example. Um, also, same thing for others. So now we are, uh, you know, in the process of building an eye tracker, for example, for <laughs> for Elixir. So that's like a whole, <laughs> a whole another space for privacy and security issues. Uh, so you would be able to experiment with that. Uh, that's in process again. Um, and same thing with with other sensors, right? So like you know the depth camera for example that uh, there's an io link between the depth camera and the and the rest of the system you know can what what can happen there uh, i don't know so so there's there's lots of uh, opportunities mm -hmm. i was also curious about um the multi user capabilities um i i guess i saw that you're working with the arena people but um because some of the, the last class of like location teleportation, all that stuff was uh, all about like multi-user experiences. So I was just wondering um, where it looks at is on, on that front. Yeah, so that is also actually work. Um, uh, we don't have a student. So unlike all the other things that I said that are already happening, uh, this one is uh, the, the one, one issue is that Arena works with um, WebXR, and again, yeah. there's no OpenXR yeah. um, yeah. uh, interface for that. There is one now on, on Android platforms that uh, we are looking into. So again, once the Android port comes along, then that, then that would happen. So we had a student looking into this, and then we had to stop the work because, you know, the OpenXR capability issue. But so that's gated on the, on the whole Android uh, infrastructure coming up. So once we have that, then we can start looking into WebXR for Android and make sure that there are no issues there and then move on. So it is very, very high on our list of priorities, but there's still unknowns there. So hopefully next semester that will happen as well. Yeah, I, it's, it's really hard to do the multi-user sometimes. So, I mean, we played a lot with those things, so I can understand it takes a long time. Like it's kind of tricky yeah. to get it to well, work. Once, and, you know. yeah. I think once we get the open XR thing working, it's not going to be that hard because, um, you know, we can just run arena on top of the stack. So that's the initial that's the initial goal is just to run arena on top of um, our stack. I see. And I the see. Interesting part will be when we can actually get arena to integrate with with Elixir in terms of the scheduling and and all of the runtime. So right now arena will just run as an application. Uh, and that's 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 not hard once we solve the WebXR OpenXR interface issue. Mm, I see. Okay, so it's all going to all WebXR. I don't know too much about WebXR. Just play with it a bit, but yeah. yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, I guess Chase is here. He was the one looking at this. Chase, do you have anything more to say about this? Uh, no, that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, we we, we there, there seem to be very limited. Uh, there, there, there are a few applications I think that um, claim to support uh, both WebXR and OpenXR um, that, that we could theoretically use. Um, Wolvik is, I think, the name of the Android browser that that we're hoping to use. Um, Chrome supports it on Windows, but Elixir doesn't currently support Windows at the moment. Um, and then I think. Uh, I forget the name of it. It's like WebKit, I think, is what Safari is based off of. Theoretically supports it, but it hasn't had updates in so long. It's basically unusable. Um, so that that that's pretty much where we're at as far as that goes. I see. I, I mean, I don't want to get too much into the weeds, but if it's all web based, will that introduce additional latencies? Um, like compared to running like AR Core or something natively on on Android. So that's a good question, and uh, so we don't have anyone from Arena here. Usually, at, uh, yeah, I don't know what happened with the uh, guys today, but um, uh, they do run Arena. So I have used Arena myself. Mm -hmm. it works reasonably well for the things that they're doing. Uh, so you know, it'll be an interesting question to see, right? Like uh, for more aggressive uh, things, what you know, what 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 are the and so on. I think that will be, uh, you know, being able to do that kind of benchmarking ourselves would be very interesting, I think. 
Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then eventually we do want this to, to interface directly with Elixir. So um, to, to, to take the key aspects of Arena, you know, about multi-user interactions and, uh, and somehow get into Elixir. Yeah, we haven't worked this out, but it's, it's certainly something of interest. And if you folks want to get involved with that, you know, that'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah, I can look in, into it. I have not played with Arena myself. Well, yeah, but I, it'd be good to look into. Um, one of the aspects that I think we, on, in our ongoing, want to visualize stuff in the multi-user setting. So, and it's like off the shelf. So that could be something really nice to play with Elixir if, if you can figure out how those pieces all. Yeah, yeah. I'd have to like look more into the details, yeah. Um, One of the but, things you're talking about is not, at least in this talk, is not whether multiple users are interacting with each other in any way other than, you know, poison. You have an attacker poisoning the cloud infrastructure, right? So that does not require yeah. these two to interact, right? So you can, I mean, you can sort of fake that interaction by actually poisoning the cloud, and then you know your the, the you know another device, right, uh, getting the state from the cloud and seeing what happens, right? So yeah. So for the things you've talked about, I don't see the, yeah, I think you can do it already with, with what Elixir has, it seems to me. Yeah, we just, as you said, you, you put it exactly right. We need a second device to act and then view something. So uh, yeah, we're just yeah. still thinking about how to, how to, we can develop it on our own or, but if there's a way to do it more easily with some platforms like Elixir, that would be, that would be all the fancy visualizations and everything already, so. Yeah. yeah. So actually, do you have? So you mentioned this public uh, cloud thing. Is that? Uh, can you tell us what that is, or is this? Software? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. It's called. Um. It's called Mapillary. So it's a subsidiary of Meta. So, um, we started on this project. We got the money from Meta, and they're like, "Oh, why don't you look into Mapillary? They probably want to use it for, uh, for AR in the future." So that's why we started digging into that. So they basically have this point cloud repository in their cloud. And presumably in the future, AR devices are going to access it and read from it and visualize stuff based on that point cloud. I see. I see. Yeah. So that should be doable now already. Yeah. So that's like, okay. Yeah. That that that's, that sounds de de definitely would would love to uh, follow up with that. Uh, I guess yeah. uh, there were a, there are a few hands. I saw. Uh, Abhishek, you still want to ask a question? I saw your hand go up and then come down. Oh yeah, I had the one question. Uh, I, I think pro it was probably not mentioned, but something uh, because I I did my PhD also in security, so something I was really thinking uh, there was a thing called dark patterns. So I think the in the web browser, I think there's already a lot of work, but I feel like in the VR usually there's a lot more information going out. So it's much easier to get any like non-sophisticated user click, you know, any link which directs to malware infected AR server. You know, I was wondering like, are you guys interested in this one? Because that just opens a whole bunch of security, network security dimension. So, so just so I understand you mean uh, get on like bad links? Or yeah. Yeah, just getting you just click on some link which could lead to some malware infected AR servers. The, here, the, the, the idea is that uh, in AR uh, immersive environment, there's a more information yeah. about the user streaming. So it might be possible to build the sort of link or present a scenario to user, which will confuse users. So because usually you can make it a bit more realistic um or you mean like uh for example you could uh just like dns spoofing you cause a user to click on the bad link and uploading yes, stuff uh, to like a, yes. the bad like a fake cloud server or something like that right or yeah, yes here uh, yes sim similarly the key idea here is that uh, in the immersive environment as i have seen like in my mm -hmm. own work people their their guards are down like you know usually you wouldn't like I'm, you are using the computer in a non-immersive environment, your safety guard would be like, uh, you'd be more conscious, but in the immersive environment, uh, it's a bit easier to trick. You'll let your guards down once you are fully immersed. 
oh i see so i guess that's more on the, like, the human factor side of things like whether you could like distract the user with other things and then they won't pay much attention to looking like a legitimate interacting with legit interface or something like that right yeah y yes i guess once... another yeah yeah we've been thinking about that in the teleportation attacks like yeah, maybe you're logging into your maybe logging into your bank in a in ar um but if you show a fake version of that to the user and still allow the user to to input their data um that could be bad but but i guess what you're saying is um um it can kind of distract things around them um so they're not super focused on validating the evaluating whether the interface is like correct or correct or real or fake right no, yeah, more or less, because we have evidence from our pilot digit study that you just let their guards down in immersive environment. So, oh, I so see. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that could be that could be interesting aspect. Work on like basically when things are animated, then people don't notice like errors in the like if the object is drifting a little bit, but the object is also animated, then people don't notice the. So it's kind of like what you're saying, like you distract the user, they don't notice small problems as very much. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Nail, I know you have had your hand up for a while. Uh, why don't we let Ying uh, go? Because I, I don't want to I don't want to run out of time before he asks this question. And then maybe I'll add a couple okay. of thoughts. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay, Ying. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor. So my question is also still related to the side channel linkages and is also perhaps related to the shared memory thing. So have you looked into the cache hierarchy or in general, the memory hierarchy in these headsets? Because I am thinking like whether it is also possible to leak some information from the cache access pattern or, you know, like cache hit rate, miss rate, et cetera. So the reason I'm asking, because I was thinking like, perhaps we can use the oblivious RAM method to avoid some kind of a leakage, but you know, like it has a very high overhead of those permutation, et cetera. And we don't want that high overhead in a real time system, especially when we're applying that to a cache. So I'm wondering if you have looked into that or not, thanks. Um, yeah, we haven't looked into that. Um, honestly, I'm not a computer architect, so Niall and Sarita are probably the ones to answer this question, but um, but I've been discussing with Niall, like whether we could look in some of the more harder aspects. Um, so I, um, I, yeah. Sorry, sorry, GSC. So I actually yeah, worked in, in microarchitecture security, and our first instinct was to look for those kinds of channels, uh, Ying, but the performance counters are easier and kind of encapsulate a lot more information and require less. So for a lot of the microarchitecture attacks, you have to figure out how to co-locate on the GPU in a certain way, for example, to get access to a shared cache or something like that. Exactly. Uh, so I expect that these channels are there, but they might be sort of more work to get at than the, than the ones that we've already been exploiting. And perhaps once we, if we find a way to close the first set of vulnerabilities, then those would be the next set to think about, right? If those became, the most fruitful ones for the attackers to to target. I see. Thank you. So, uh, yeah. I mean, usually, like computer architects and micro architects are treating the cache or the whole memory hierarchy as a black box. So I was wondering if we can explore something there and perhaps you know like use some cache coherence protocols to defend against some possible attacks. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting to explore that. Yeah, I mean, it's a, of course, a complex and, you know, heterogeneous system. So I expect that we'll have to, it won't be that we get just a prime and probe attack and it would work out of the box. We'll have to customize that kind of attack to this environment. Thank you so much. I, I want to just add, like, I think there's also like on, on a single device, but also if we have this like shared state in the cloud and the multiple devices are accessing this pool of shared memory to have this shared experience, I can easily imagine like there's some malicious VM or something on, also co-located on the cloud and they're like poking around the shared memory and so on. So I think the multi-user scenario would also be really interesting to explore. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, thank you. Nice. So, so, yeah, if, if I may uh, get back to the, uh, I guess the location teleportation attacks and the shared state. Um, 
I guess my question is whether there is something fundamental there that we can extract and sort of provide in the runtime or whether these problems have to be uh, kind of solved individually application by application, right? So, so I think at a high level, we, the shared state can be like different things. So we, you know, so your presentation showed mapillary uh, GIC, but it could easily be like some collaborative slam where we have like transient state, state that is shared maybe locally between nearby users or something like that. And it seems the main vulnerability is that we're able to poison that state and we're like too unquestioning when somebody contributes something. And then on the other side, perhaps we could uh, provide some inputs to have access to part of the state where, where we're not supposed to have access, such as the example with the hologram and the picture that you had. So I wonder if there's a, you know, if we can step back and extract something fundamental that would be supported or, um, or not, I'm, I'm just curious. So like with respect to locations, you mentioned the location authentication, but would that cover every opportunity for poisoning state or should we be thinking about something more general? Yeah. I guess we need to think more in general, when you have this shared state, it's like a map of the environment, then what user should have access to the state at what times, like some kind of permissions and, and so on. Um, I guess just to find maybe something, some kind of access pattern. Yeah. 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 So I think the arena folks have solved some of those issues. That's exactly the kind of thing we want to uh, incorporate from arena into, mm -hmm. uh, you know, into this larger system. So it's uh, too bad none of them are here today. I think they were. Uh, I think at nine stock, you know, the the, the arena group was particularly excited, but. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but that's definitely where we are going. So you may want to look at the arena paper, GNC, if you haven't already. Um, but that's uh, that's definitely where we are going to have a, a sort of a common security architecture. I mean, they haven't solved all the problems, but uh, yeah, because I've seen work on like if you know you have an application, like user can define different permissions, like you should be able to see this and I should go see that, and then they kind of enforce that. But I guess what we're playing with here is more location-based accesses. Uh -huh. um, so, and... Yeah, 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 I see what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, you check more, yeah. Yeah, I see what you're saying, yeah. And so maybe there's a natural extension to to that architecture that, that we could explore. But I appreciate the question about, you know, for this particular, these sorts of attacks, what is a, what is a foundational kind of framework mm -hmm. that, that would prevent these? Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, because every platform is different, right? I mean, in exactly how their API works or, and so on. So, yeah, I think it would be, it's a good develop something more general. Yeah. yeah. Any other thoughts, Nayo? <laughs> I'm good, thank you. Yeah, yeah and, uh, you know, um, so we would be very uh, excited if um, if you wanted to Use Elixir uh, if Elixir is the right test bed for you to do these sorts of experiments and build out this type of framework. I think that'd be pretty cool. If you'd like to help us get Arena, um, you know, into Elixir, I think that would be pretty cool too. Again, we are waiting for this Android thing to happen, and then mm -hmm. uh, the Arena folks uh, will also be involved. Um, let's see. Uh, you, yeah, you talked about the shared memory. Um, uh, VIO thing. Can you say a little bit about that, uh, Jansi? That's actually interesting because we have a lot of uh, work on hardware accelerators using shared memory, et cetera. And I don't know if that's what you're indicating or you're talking about shared state in the cloud or what. So tell us a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, so it's a recent work we just published in, in Conex um, just like a few months ago. And basically it's the shared state in the cloud, but that shared state uses shared memory. So multiple client, you have this uh, point cloud that all the users come and update. And then the way they update that that point cloud is stored in the shared memory. So it's easy for people to come in and access it and, and modify. Um, and the goal there is to make it fast for AR users to then access this shared state by avoiding like um, uh, serialization and deserialization and blah, 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 those kinds of things. Um, I see, I see, I see. So like, how did you evaluate that? I mean. Do you like how did you evaluate the you know the the latency et cetera and what the impact of that is on the end user and so on? Um, yeah, so we evaluate like end-to-end -end latency in terms of different components. So the network part, then the access to the shared memory, then the computation that's done on the 
data structures in the shared memory and then returning the results to the user. So we have all of the different the different components. Um, so it's basically like BIO with shared memory, <laughs> essentially. Um, but the reason I brought it up here is because I, I kind of I know that sort of you're an expert on these in these in this area. So yeah, I don't know if some of your work could be applied here, or maybe we could look at some of the so, like, so we, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we recently uh, wrote something up. It's it's still in review about offloading VIO to uh, servers, and the latency goes pretty high. So we, you know, one of the key contributions was to show how and why uh, we are still able to tolerate that latency from an end-to-end -end user perspective. But it's not kind of obvious that that you know those latencies can actually uh, work, right? That that you just don't completely lose tracking. So, so you actually had an end-to-end -end system where, uh, where you showed that that you still can maintain tracking when you're going. Yeah, we basically we basically offloaded everything. So there have been previous approaches that offload, like, like just maybe tracking is still on the device and mapping is on the server. But we put everything on the server, and then we show that as long as your network is like decent enough, then the server doesn't really produce any bottlenecks, and you can still have like thirty fps um, tracking. So. Um, I'm happy to share and we or discuss further. Yeah. Um, okay. So, what kind of latencies were you seeing? Um, it was like it, we for tracking we get 30 fps and 30 frames per second, and also we also look at the mapping. So it's like when users contribute data, their information needs to be incorporated into the point cloud. So that was I think on the order of like 200 milliseconds or so. Um, cause for mapping, you don't need it to be super real time. It's okay to be a little bit later. So is around 200, I think. Yeah. I could double check. Yeah, that's fine. But the 30 FPS, like what's the latency? Because that's really critical. Not to you. I mean, that 30 FPS corresponds to 30, 30 milliseconds or so, right? Um, well, I mean, the FPS can be higher, right? If the, if, if you're running a pipeline, so, so if. I mean, you can still get a throughput of 30 FPS, but the latency from the point you sent the camera. Oh, the initial one? I, uh, I will have to double check. I think it was still low, but I'll, I'll double check on that. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, okay, I'd be actually interested in seeing seeing that. Uh, yeah. yeah, I can if you have, I can send the slides or if you have a student or something, I'm happy to, to discuss more. It might be a- Okay, all right, great. Yeah. Um, okay. So, is there like anything immediate that sort of comes to mind that we may uh, work on that uh, uh, that would help you all, or or you folks can contribute either way, or we can collaborate? Like, is there an immediate next step here? I think in my mind, I'm really I would uh, I really want to look at the the shared state part. So. I wonder if I need to look more, I guess, into what Elixir provides, but if we could use Elixir to visualize the impact of the poisoned cloud, poisoned state to the on the AR user, that might be interesting. Um, but I guess there's no A. Maybe that's not the immediate next step. <laughs> may, may I ask, uh, Sarita, sorry, I, I should have done a uh, better job at my homework of looking at Elixir, but in terms of benchmarks and uh, and applications that uh, that you have running, is it essentially anything that runs on Unreal you could uh, now run on Elixir or is there a group of applications? Yeah, that's, uh, we are still um, stress testing it out so that we can, I can say, a, you know, a, a clear yes to that. Right now, all of our experiments have been on Godot, which is a Linux game engine that was one of the first to support OpenXR. So that's a completely, the nice thing about Godot is that it's completely open source. Mm -hmm. So not only do you have the runtime open source, but also the game engine itself right. is open source. So that one I can confidently say, right, we can run uh, all of the uh, you know, applications there. Mm -hmm. uh, Unreal is still being tested and uh, we, should, we should put it out really soon. So uh, once we have that, then the answer to your question would be a uh, clear yes. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, I I don't know. So because I mean, one of the challenges we have with the with the shared state is that we can't find a lot of applications that are 
sort of using it and you know maybe popular enough to make a, a dent and i wonder whether it's worth it to try to develop a benchmark for uh, elixir that does that yeah. that would be great and then you know you don't it doesn't have to be a benchmark for elixir right it would mm -hmm. be running on top of unreal and so that you can yeah. use it for for anything right yeah yeah uh, yeah, yeah exactly that 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 uh, in fact that is one of the things that i am trying to push for is get people to create content right mm -hmm. For, uh, for these systems that we can use, like open source content that we can actually. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, so this is definitely high on our list and uh, the more people who do it, the better for the community. Yeah, so we'd be happy to get involved, help collaborate, whatever on such an app. Yeah, I think maybe, uh... Jesse, it's worth it to uh, to brainstorm a little bit and then maybe come back to the group with uh, with some suggestions if we can think of some. Yeah, I think so because it seems uh, we have to think of what the current capabilities are and what we could build on top of that. Yeah. yeah. So you know, some things that come to my mind that are sort of almost immediately that you could use Elixir for are the things you talked about. You know, from the network point of view, trying to figure out signatures and so on. Right, so that you can use almost immediately, right? Because um, you can mess around with the you can mess around with the internals of the networking stack, right? You can do whatever you want when you're transferring uh, or when you're communicating data and uh, and see the impact of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess so. But for that, we'd have to make we'd have to work on these uh, applications as well, right? That produce the traffic <laughs> that we're spying on. Well, uh, so we already have some applications, right? Oh, I and see. So, so you know, we already run on 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 Godot, right? So you've seen some of the some of the uh, uh, some of the demos that we have on our website. That, yeah, I saw a few of them. Yeah, yeah. I wonder how much network traffic they produce if they're like a single user. Like a Sponza scene is probably not going to produce a lot of traffic. Um, but anyway, yeah. Well, again, you know, the frame rates are, the frame sizes are pretty high. So uh, as far as, rent, so I should put another caveat here. We are not yet uh, rendering, um, uh, offloading rendering yet, uh, because again, the frame rates are high. So we are still trying to compress and, you know, making sure that, uh, that we can, uh, uh, you know, do a good job there. So keep in mind that we are running at, um, you know, 120 hertz, right? So this is, a lot of the old literature looks, you know, they're looking at 60 hertz frame rates uh, with, you know, relatively small frame sizes. Once you increase all of that, the bandwidth goes up pretty significantly. Okay, so you offload just the comp the the computation part of it, that the rendering is still on the device? So, yeah, so right now we're just offloading VIO, like the system that's out oh. there that's that's merged on GitHub is, is still just offloading VIO. I see. But we're working also on offloading rendering and uh, uh, yeah, simple forms of that we can do right now. But uh, if you want to do it more efficiently, then that's still, we're still working on. I see. Okay, then that's some traffic because you, you're probably offloading all the frames to the real world frames, right? To do the tracking. So yeah, that would pretty We're also doing, we also have seen reconstruction and we're going to be offloading that and We've done some research to do that more smartly. So that's still under review. We haven't put that up. I see, I see. I guess the more immediate one maybe is just looking at the performance kind of the different types of hardware. Um, Cause then we don't need to develop applications, right? If we just, we can see if these attacks and apply to, to other types of hardware. Well, um, you can also see VIO, right? So we are offloading VIO, right? And so you, you're, we are offloading camera frames. So the physical environment of the user is being offloaded, right? And so yeah. there's, there's, you know, in fact, people don't want to do that because of privacy and security risks. Uh, so you could actually take that. And in fact, I have students here who are very much interested in that, that would actually be to how to change the algorithm and what should we be actually offloading? Should we really be offloading the entire camera frame and what kind of attacks can happen there? So that's, a, and then you're running. So, so keep in mind that this is, when we say we're offloading VIO, we're running the full system, right? So we mm -hmm. actually are wearing the headset, walking around, right? With mm -hmm. or whatever, right? Um, you know, going, the, uh, the cameras are taking the, 
uh, uh, recording the physical location where we are walking around, sending that those frames to the server and the and the and Elixir itself on the on the PC or wherever we're running it um, is uh, is doing all of the rendering and so on. But it's a real application, right? So we can actually see on our headset, right? We use the headset as a display. So Elixir runs on a PC or a Jetson or whatever platform sends the pixels to the to the headset. So we can actually see what's happening in the application on our. Mm -hmm. So if you have an attack, we can actually see what the what the impact of that attack is in real time. Yeah, no, I think that's a big advantage because I think the kind of work we've yeah. been doing is just playing with the VIO itself, but not doing all yeah. the rendering and so on because that's yeah, yeah, yeah. We have the whole system, and yeah. so uh, you know, uh, we know what it's supposed to look like, and we and and any attack, any defense, we can actually. See, this is giving me a headache, right? You can even see that. Right? Yeah. So that might be shared state actually, because if you if you have the track running on the server, then if we then we could see the impact probably on the user. Uh, so so this is this is just tracking, right? So tracking has um I think I think it would be really interesting. Like there are immediate things to be done on. Um, how do you spoof, you know, everything that's going on the network, right? So you're sending these camera images on the network, which is basically revealing the user's um, uh, the user's physical environment, right? Yes. Uh, and so, you know, there's, you know, what uh, can you, uh, for example, change, do something about. Um, about um, uh, you know, can, can you send sort of the wrong post to the system so that the user then I'm just making this up, okay? As I talk, so the yeah. user then instead of walking straight, just goes and bangs against a wall, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in their physical environment, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, the system is um, is 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 producing right the wrong kind of uh, uh, images, right? so mm -hmm. uh, things like that. So I don't. Uh, there's there's potential stuff here that I as a non security person <laughs> am not am not uh, uh, you know it'll take me a while to sit and think about all of this but <laughs> we can definitely provide help uh, you know collaborate on our side uh, with with uh, with system support to do all of to to uh, to both inject attacks as well as come up with solutions. Anyways, mm -hmm. here, Chin Chin is not here. She's actually working on um, on how to how to reduce the amount of information that we are actually sending on the network. Uh, so you're not sending the actual pixels of the room, but you're sending more, like you're sending features instead of pixels and stuff. So like I'm that. sorry, I, I was asked, uh, wondering whether, like, when you apply optimizations, like uh, you know, for V8 and rendering and things like that, are you thinking of offloading that, or would you? Would you have part of the pipeline running on the headset to make sure that what you're offloading is not everything? Yeah, so that is a big research question, in fact, right? How to schedule what to offload, what not to offload, because it depends on how much network bandwidth you have at the moment, I how see. much, what your battery is, and so on, right? Okay. And so that's one of the research questions that we are going to be looking at. So right now we are building the building block so that we can actually do good experiments. Okay. Yeah. Again, yeah, I mean, almost our we try to do things end to end so that we really get useful metrics for quality, like mm -hmm. as opposed to just you know, I mean, quality in terms of the experience that the user has. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because yeah, that, that has implications on the network channel, uh, network bandwidth, right? So it's it might we might be able to infer things about the state of the device and so on. I don't know how interesting that is. So, sorry, Jeff, please go ahead. You made a good point. I just wanted to add that it, um, it's very complex. It's not like figure out what to schedule when is is really difficult with VIO, I think, because <clears throat> there are so many dependencies between the different modules. So it's not like you take a deep learning network, neural network, and you split it, and it's like kind of straightforward. It's like yeah. positioning stuff and putting things in different places. It has all these crazy dependencies and logs, and it's like a huge headache. Okay. Yeah, our work, we so, put everything onto the server. It was just simpler because if you try to split them, it's like developing a baseline where you split stuff is actually more complex, like dumping everything together. So yeah, so actually, that. yeah, you'll find with Elixir is it's written in a really modular way, and so 
we are yeah I, you know i won't brag but <laughs> and then you'll find that that it lets you do it's it's written exactly for this kind of thing so that you can split things up um relatively easily mm -hmm. uh yeah yeah so so now maybe we should go back and sort of um think a bit more about what would be sort of low-hanging things we could we could do and and also some some more long-term things we, we could discuss as well yeah Sounds yeah, <laughs> I think uh, for me, like, I think, you know, it's just, uh, uh, it's just great to get started, right? So mm -hmm. even if uh, I think uh, if we could work together, like, you know, we can uh, help with, I, I, we, we have students who are interested in this area, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I'm not a security person, so it would be cool to, to have you folks, uh, you know, collaborating with us so that we can uh, provide the support you need for for getting the infrastructure you need and doing the experiments and so on, yeah. Great. Sounds great. All right. Thanks so much. This was good. Right. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you. It's been helpful. Bye-bye.